no doubt, a very cold, blowy morning. They've even tried to stop us getting in this morning, putting roadblocks up, but I know you just powered through and you're here. It's great to see you. One or two others might still be coming in. Jim Campbell's going to come uh, right away and bring you just a, a, an update on behalf of the, the COVID search team. The COVID, not the COVID search team, that's mixing up two things. <laughs> the, the COVID team who have done a, a wonderful job uh, for almost two years already. It's ridiculous, really. But they've done a fantastic job. So, Jim, just give us a little update, please. Uh, we don't need to search for COVID. It's finding us. <laughs> No, just a, a wee announcement. Following the First Minister's announcement two weeks ago, the uh, detailed update uh, of the COVID regulations were published on Friday. That's the regulations for places of worship. As expected, the advisory regulation on one metre social distancing has ended, and we have followed that guidance by allowing households to mix and to sit together. However, that one metre social distancing has been replaced by what's called physical distancing, with, with no distance mentioned at all, no, no standard of distance. Our understanding of that is that whilst we can, households can sit together in the church, that's no problem, you shouldn't come together, hug, kiss, uh, shake hands or, or whatever. That, that seems to be what's, what the regulation is saying. Don't be, blame me, I'm just the bearer of the, the news. We're also still guided to avoid pinch points, i.e. places where people can bunch and to avoid too many people touching the same item at the same time, hence the reason why we haven't put the collection uh, bags around today. So leaving, we'll still follow the one-way system so you can access the... Um, the offering boxes on your way out and we'll ask you not to, to bunch to, together and not to dally in the entrance hall and to walk all the way through. We've also decided to keep the cloakroom uh, closed off as well while this regulation continues, hopefully not for too long. And of course face coverings are still mandatory and we still have to ventilate it's a difficult thing for us to judge. Sometimes it's too cold, sometimes it's too windy, but we try to regulate it to enable enough ventilation to occur. Thanks very much for your patience, because mine is running out. <laughs> <laughs> and the COVID team, I'm not going to preach on the verse, greet one another with a holy kiss for the next few weeks while that regulation is, is there. Welcome. Uh, there are some other notices, and uh, I'll just run through them quickly. Yes, you can still give, and we encourage you still to give. Uh, you can do that by direct debit, and many of you do that. But if you still would prefer to give using cash, then uh, place your cash or your envelopes in the, the box or boxes as you leave. Today's the last Sunday of the month, which means it's the last opportunity to give to our mission focus for January, Mission Aviation Fellowship. We encourage you to do that if you can. Um, and then as the month changes to February, on Wednesday night at uh, 7.30 on Zoom, we're going to be focusing on next month's mission focus, which is the Hiding Place Orphanage. There it is in Girocaster. Some of you have been there. And uh, it's an orphanage that the church has supported over many, many years. And the reason that that meeting is still on Zoom is because we've got one or two special guests from Albania joining us and uh, so it was just easier to keep that online so that's Wednesday at 7 30. A little bit sooner though tonight at 6 30 again on Zoom uh, will be our uh, prayer time and uh, devotions and that's going to be led tonight by Morris Craig and we're looking forward to what Morris has prepared for that and just one final reminder that next Sunday morning here it will uh, incorporate communion and we'll share that together. And if you're watching at home and you're not able to be at this service, then we encourage you to have some bread and wine or fruit juice uh, ready to hand, and you'll also be able to participate in that act of worship then. Let's pray as we settle our hearts and remind ourselves why we're here and we come into God's presence. Heavenly Father, it says in your word, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Lord, may that be our 
motivation, our encouragement, and our experience today. That by being together here, or by watching from home, that we can have our hearts lifted, our spirits uh, lifted, and encouraged, and reminded that you are still God, and you are still good. We thank you that you are our heavenly Father, and a good Father who lavishes his children with gifts. Indeed, your word reminds us again that every good gift comes from you. Help us this morning to uh, respond to your goodness as we praise and as we worship. We give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. One uh, sad note to report, and that is that uh, Ian Cunningham, known to many of you, uh, passed away yesterday. And uh, we remember Ian, uh, his wife, Nancy, and uh, his children, uh, his son and his daughter at this time. Funeral details will be made available when they become uh, arranged. Well, we're going to sing. And we're going to sing a wonderful song of praise as we begin our worship this morning. The splendor of the King. How great is our God. More is here to play for us, which is wonderful. And we'll invite you to stand as the introduction is played. And as you do, I'm going to invite the boys and girls and young people uh, to head off to their groups now. But uh, everyone else is standing just now. And uh, we're going to have a short time of prayer. And if you're watching at home, I encourage you to do the same. You won't hear the prayers as they're offered in the church because I'm the only person with a microphone on. So you won't hear anyone else. But I'm going to encourage you to pray. Uh, and as we've been doing these last few weeks, just to offer short prayers of thanksgiving. Particularly, we've just been singing, How Great Is Our God. 
Surely we can think of things to give thanks for this morning, for God's greatness, for his majesty, for his power, for his glory. So just speak out your prayers, and then we'll carry on in our worship in a few moments' time. Amen. Do take your seats, folks. Thank you so much. Just keep your eyes on the screen. You're going to just see a little improvised reading of part of what we're going to be looking at later from Luke chapter 24. Thanks, Nigel. It's Sunday, and two of Jesus' friends are walking back from Jerusalem to Emmaus, their village. They're walking slowly. They're talking over the things that have happened. They're sad and low. And Jesus turns up walking next to them, but they're kept from recognizing that it's him. And he says, what are you talking about? They look at him with open mouths. Are you the only stranger, says Cleopas, who doesn't know what's been going on in Jerusalem these past few days? So tell me about it, fill me in, says Jesus. And he says, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, the prophet, he was mighty in word and deed with a great reputation with all the people. We thought he was the one. We hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. But the leaders took him. They took him and tried him and handed him over to the Romans for execution. He died. And all of this was three days ago. And what's worse, this morning, some of the women came and freaked us out. They told us they went to find his body and it was gone, that the tomb was open. And then they said something about angels and angel voices and that they saw Jesus. And so others ran to see if what they'd said was true, and they found the tomb empty, but Jesus wasn't there. And Jesus said to them, How foolish you are, how slow of heart, to believe all that was written in the scriptures. Didn't it have to be this way? Didn't the Messiah have to suffer before he'd be glorified? And starting with Moses and working through the scriptures, he told them all the things about himself that were there and were to happen and had happened. And as they got to Emmaus, Jesus was going to carry on. And they stopped him and said, come on, it's late, it's dark, come in, eat with us, stay with us tonight. And he went in. And as they sat down to eat, Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. And that was the moment. They knew it was him. They realised, they saw him, they recognised him and he disappeared just vanished. And the two of them jumped up and ran all the way back to Jerusalem. The seven miles they'd already come, they went back and they found all of the others together in a room and they were saying, it's true. He's appeared to Simon. He's alive. Jesus is alive. And the two said, we've just seen him on the road and we didn't know it was him. But when he broke the bread, we knew it was Jesus. Just me, or do you think the cameraman needs to go to Specsavers? <laughs> it's quite distracting, that, wasn't it? But we'll, we'll focus in on the verses rather, and I'll not be moving around with that in a few moments, okay? Um, many of you know um, that uh, Ali and I are moving um, in just a few weeks' time now. I suppose after Tuesday, it'll be next month um, because it's really coming in quite quickly now. Um, grateful for your prayers into all of that. Moving to Wales means moving to a different uh, church, a different church culture, different church history. And of course, just over 100 years ago, Wales had the most remarkable revival. We were praying for more of that, not just in Wales, but here in Scotland as well. Uh, the song that we're about to sing was known as the love song of the Welsh 
revival. And let me just read to you a little bit about it before we sing it uh, together. Uh, written by William Rees, who played a prominent role in that Welsh revival, which was led by the evangelist Evan Roberts. I want to read you this little report. As with any great evangelistic movement, its success was closely associated with music and musicians. One of the most notable revival singers was a young woman, Annie Davis of Maesteg. According to one account printed in 1907, her voice emerged from a meeting and with it, the song by Rees. This is the report written in 1907. In the first part of the first day, Evan Roberts was overcome as at his initiation. He fell on his face in the pew beneath the pulpit, weeping aloud and interceding. When he was able to calm himself, he rose and left and did not return till the evening. The service in the meanwhile conducting itself without a break. It was on Friday evening at the closing service of the mission here that the voice of a young girl of 18, Miss Annie Davis of Maesteg, came into the history of the revival. Professing Christ from childhood, trained in her home to serve him with her vocal gifts, she sang with tears on her face and victory in her voice, the mighty love song of the revival the hymn of Dr. William Rees. The song is of the marvel of divine love, flowing as vast oceans of tender mercies in never-ebbing flood tide, of the very Prince of Life dying, dying to redeem our forfeit life. You don't get reports like that these days, do you? Written such beautiful prose. We're going to hear, first of all, the song being sung in Welsh because I need to attune my ears to that and I thought it would please you Andrea this morning. Once you've heard the first couple of verses being sung in Welsh we're going to stand and Maura's going to play as we sing Here is Love Vast as the Ocean but just stay seated and listen to it first of all. Thanks Nigel.
beautiful hymn and then hearing it sung in Welsh do pray for me you saw what some of those words are like basically I've so far learned Dichen Hoffi Coffee I like coffee is that okay uh, okay I even got that wrong Andrea and my phone are going to be linked for many months to come so as we get going this morning, looking at God's Word, uh, turn to Luke chapter 24, that passage that we heard uh, read or performed, however you want to describe that uh, improvised reading. But let me ask you a question as you do that. I wonder if you can think, what was the best sermon you've ever heard? How many sermons, in fact, can you remember and retain? What can you remember about them? What made it memorable? And how much, if I asked you about it, could you actually relay to me? What was the preacher like? Were they biblical? Were they entertaining? Were they funny? Were they poignant? Did they make you laugh? Did they make you cry? Did they challenge you? Did they encourage you? Was it a thought-provoking sermon? Was it something that changed your life? Well, today, in our Roadside Assistance series, we're going to take some time to consider... Two people who would never forget one particular message that they heard for quite amazing reasons. And I think it's perhaps the most obvious example of roadside assistance that we're going to uh, encounter in this little mini-series. So let's read together from Luke chapter 24. We're going to pick it up in verse 13. We've just been singing about the Mount of Crucifixion. And this is happening around Easter weekend as we would know it. That same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what's more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, "How foolish you are! How slow to believe that all the pro- how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken! Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory?" And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. 
as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. We'll return to a later part of that passage, so put your bookmark or your, your thumb in there for now. Excuse me. These two disciples would have no trouble remembering their journey to Emmaus that day. What a Bible lesson that must have been from the one who wrote it, the one who breathed it, the one who lived it. Imagine their despondency as they set out from Jerusalem. It was a good time to be leaving Jerusalem that morning. Jerusalem held bitter memories. The feast was over, and so it seemed were all their hopes, all their dreams for the future. And when we join them on this seven-mile walk, they're discussing what they've just witnessed. The word that's used in verse 15 suggests more than a discussion. It speaks of debating, even arguing, passion. And they had been privy to some of these shocking revelations that the women had returned with from the tomb that Jesus had mysteriously appeared to them and then that somehow he had come back to life. Maybe they were arguing about whether that was even possible. Maybe they were arguing about what they would do now. Where would they go now? There's some suggestion that they were husband and wife. So it's entirely possible they could have been arguing about absolutely anything, couldn't they? But it's while they're talking, it's while they're discussing all the things of these last few days, suddenly a stranger approaches them and joins them as they walk. Now, for the culture that we live in, that would be a strange thing, wouldn't it? Normally, in our world, people hardly even say good morning to the person that they sit, sit next to on the train or the bus. Many people don't even know the names of their neighbours. A hundred years ago, that would have been unthinkable in this country. But we live in our little bubbles, not just because of covid if you were to go for a walk around Cumbria this afternoon, by the way, don't. You have to stay in your house at about three o'clock today because of the wind that's coming. But if you were, and a stranger just approached, suddenly started walking alongside us and talking to us, I wonder what we'd make of it. Well, these first century disciples, thankfully, didn't seem to suffer from our highly strung attitudes towards strangers approaching us on the middle of a walk. So the journey continues and there's now three instead of two. And before long, a conversation starts up with Jesus asking what they've been talking about. What have you been discussing? Now, that seems curious to us, doesn't it? Because we know the secret, don't we? We've read the story. We know what's going on. Jesus well knew what they were talking about. It might be seen by us, therefore, to seem slightly playful of Jesus, knowing full well that it's he himself who's been the focus of their thoughts and their conversations. I think there's even a slight comedic edge to this, which one of us hasn't wanted to be a fly on the wall and hear what people are saying about us sometimes. Well, that's exactly the position that Jesus is in here, since the travelers we read are prevented from recognizing him at this point. They don't know. How does that happen? Well, we don't know that either. It just says in verse 16, their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Did God angle the sun in such a way to prevent them looking directly at Jesus? Did Jesus somehow have some kind of heavenly disguise for those few hours? Did God do something to their eyes 
We don't know. It just says they couldn't recognize him. And they are incredulous to discover that Jesus has not heard of the happenings of the weekend in Jerusalem, back up the road. You must have been the only person in the city not to know what's been going on, says Cleopas in verse 18. Look at verse 19, how he describes Jesus. He describes him as a powerful prophet. And this was a a popular viewpoint at the time, that Jesus had come to take on the authorities. Well, he'd certainly done that. He'd been powerful in word and in deed. But ultimately, it was the authorities, seemingly, that had had the last word. They had got their man. In verse 20, we read them say, The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. And verse 21 is the verse which I think best betrays their feelings as they're walking along. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. We had hoped. Where was their hope? It was in the past. We had hoped. How ironic that they had consigned Jesus' relevance to the past Apparently, he no longer featured in their thoughts for the future, nor the future hope of Israel. He wasn't there anymore to offer them wisdom and comfort. And here they are in their present need of solace and in consolation. And yet, we know, don't we? He's right beside them. Then they revealed to Jesus that they'd heard the the woman's fanciful story. This was hot off the press. They'd been to the tomb that morning, they said, and they didn't find his body. And they relayed some story about angels telling telling them that he was alive. And some of their friends had gone to investigate, to corroborate the woman's story. But again, no one could find his body. And they hadn't seen him, the disciples. And of course, we think of Thomas, don't we, later on being described as doubting Thomas, the doubting disciple, the one needing proof. But this shows us that he wasn't alone. It may have been a prevailing response when the stories started to spread, as stories do, and the rumour mill gets going. Alive again, is he? Really? Okay. Well, tell him to come and see me then, because I want to shake his hand. He's walking around, is he? A dead man? We saw him die. I'll believe it when I see him with my own eyes. You can imagine. And I wonder, is that attitude really so different to those today who refuse to believe in God because they can't see him? They can't physically reach out and touch him. How does Jesus respond then to these things that are being put to him by the two? Well, in verse 25, his response seems maybe at first to our ears quite hard, quite harsh. How foolish you are. How slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. These don't seem on the face of it to be very pastoral words for people who have just lost their friend. But again, we're in on the secret that the travellers don't yet know. The very one that they are grieving The one in whom they had placed all of their hopes, all of their dreams. The very one that they were speaking of was the one that they were speaking to. And what's more, now he was speaking to them. How foolish you are. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory, Jesus says. Well, you know, it wouldn't happen immediately. It would take weeks, months, perhaps the rest of their lives for these and others among Jesus' disciples and his closest followers to realize the extent of Jesus' mission and to understand the completeness of his mission. Words that he had spoken publicly and privately would keep coming back to them in wave after wave and they would see them and hear them in a new light because they would now hear them in the new light of resurrection. In the life groups just now, we're looking at Mark's gospel. And as we go through Mark's gospel, we'll see just how often Jesus tried to prepare his disciples for the coming reality of his death 
and subsequent resurrection. We'll also notice, of course, how often the disciples failed to comprehend what that meant or to have any inkling what it would look like in reality. But these two, on the road to Emmaus, are in for a treat. Look at verse 27. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, Jesus, explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there? All those other sermons and messages that came to the, your mind earlier would fall away as you thought of hearing the words of the Lord Jesus himself. Someone has described this as the greatest sermon never recorded. We see them approach the village. Jesus is invited to go in with them because it's getting late. They take their places at the table to eat. Now, it's not a reenactment of the Lord's Supper, but there are obvious similarities, aren't there? Jesus takes the bread. He breaks it. He blesses it. He shares it round. This is odd behavior of a guest. Yet, in doing so, we see Jesus take command. We see Jesus' authority. And it's as he does this that the two travelers realize for the first time who it is. They realize who they've just shared their journey with. They realize who has been teaching them. They realize who's in their house, who's eating at their table. And as pennies are dropping and jaws are hitting the floor, suddenly Jesus vanishes. He's gone. And you've got to love what they say next. Look at verse 32. Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And the excitement takes hold, doesn't it? Now it doesn't matter that it's late. They're not going to sleep anyway tonight, are they? So we read on in verse 33. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. It actually says that very hour. They were packed and away back into the city. Another seven mile. I think they probably did that second seven mile a bit quicker, don't you? There wasn't a moment to waste. They had to tell somebody. Those women, they'd been right after all. Those other followers of Jesus, they've got to hear that we've seen him. <laughs> and when they get there, they, they can't take in the transformation that's taken place since they've been away. The disciples are already abuzz with excitement. The Lord has really risen. He appeared to Simon, they hear, as they arrive. And then they join in and they relay their story of their meeting with Jesus on the road to Emmaus. Can you imagine the electricity in the room? And then it goes to a whole new level. Because it says, while they're talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And peace was exactly what they needed. Because we read next that they were startled, frightened. They thought they were looking at a ghost. That might seem odd to us. They've just been hearing. They've just been sharing and corroborating stories that Jesus actually was alive. But you've got to factor in the great difference between the speculation and the excitement, the wonder of what that would feel like, and then to suddenly be looking into the eyes of someone you've loved who you'd seen die just a few days before. It's not an everyday occurrence that we can compare with our experience. This is so far off the radar of human experience that we probably need to cut them some slack here when it says that they were frightened. Jesus speaks words of peace. And then look back in the passage as we read again from verse 38. As he dispels their doubts and fears. Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds, he says. Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. As Jesus holds out his hands and shows them his feet, as he shows them his wounds, he's doing something else 
He's opening their minds. And this is the moment we've been waiting for. Because as he had done with the two on the road to Emmaus, he unpacks for the others the meaning, the extent of his mission, of his salvation plan. He shows them how his life has been fulfilling all the things spoken of him in the law and the prophets and the Psalms, verse 44 tells us. And he shows them three specific things. Look at verse 46. He shows them that the Christ had to suffer and die. And this was something, of course, that Jesus had repeatedly taught. It had been repeatedly prophesied and anticipated in the Old Testament that Christ had to suffer and die. Secondly, that Christ would be raised to life again. And these disciples are in the presence of the proof. Jesus had told them this would happen. They hadn't understood it. They couldn't imagine it. They wouldn't accept it. Now they're experiencing it. Thirdly, in verse 47, it tells us that there's still a job to be done. And in this verse, there are five specific elements which Jesus touches on. I just want to mention each one of them very, very briefly uh, before we finish this morning. Five things that we still need to bear in mind in our day and age as well as these disciples back then. First of all, that the message is to be preached. The good news of Jesus was and is to be proclaimed. And Luke will pick this story up in Acts chapter 2, where we can trace the beginning, the birth of what we know as the church. And after Peter spoke, some 3,000 were saved and added to the fledgling church. And since that day, heaven has been rejoicing each and every time a new life is turned over to Jesus. The preaching of the word is effective. God's word never returns void, never comes back empty, always accomplishes something. And without the faithful preaching of the disciples and the apostles of the early church, and then the generations ever since over these last 2,000 years, there would be no church today. And so for the church to continue, preaching of God's word, preaching of the good news of Jesus must Continue. We are each passing the baton on to the next generation until Jesus returns. Secondly, the message is to be one of repentance. So that means calling men and women to turn back from sinful lives and to start living in a Godward direction. Those who wish to enter into a relationship with the living God are called to turn to him in faith. That means admitting that the road that we have been traveling on in our lives up to that point has been the wrong one. To know God, to live for God, means to have a change of direction in our lives. When the people are cut to the heart, as it says in Acts 2, they ask what they should do. And Peter replies by saying they should repent. Literally, turn round from the way that they had been living. So the message is to be preached. The message is to be one of repentance. Thirdly, the message is to be one of forgiveness. They were to get out there and tell everyone that there no longer needed to be an obstacle between God and man because of sin. God himself had provided the sacrifice in the person of his son, Jesus. And therefore there could be full and free forgiveness for those who put their trust in him and what he achieved on the cross. Jesus had taken our place. A deal had been done whereby we could have our debts completely taken care of if we would just receive it as a free gift from God. One of forgiveness. Fourthly, in verse 47, we see that the authority for that message is Jesus' name. That's where we get our authority from. And this was a theme that Dr. Luke would continue in, to, to develop in the book of Acts. And Jesus' name carries weight. If you go through the book of Acts, you'll see that. Let me give you three or four examples. In that uh, message in chapter 2, uh, repent and each of you be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift 
of the Holy Spirit. It's the name of Jesus that transforms. Chapter 3, verse 6 in Acts. Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. Get up and walk. Jesus' name that transforms and heals. Chapter 9 in Acts to Ananias about Paul. It says, The Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Jesus' name is intrinsically linked to mission and to the individual's call to evangelize and to share the good news. It's all about the name of Jesus. If it ever becomes about your name or my name, we've got it wrong. And finally, for now in chapter 10 of Acts, of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Jesus' name is like a key that unlocks the door into your future. It's only his name that can do that. No one else. Jesus' name matters. In his name is authority. Indeed, in his name is all authority. Finally, fifth point from that uh, verse, that the message is for all people everywhere. The message will start here in Jerusalem and then it will spread out from there. And it will take till Acts chapter 10 before they begin to act on this uh, and, and move the message out. Jesus is Lord of all, so the message is to go to all. And of course, when Saul becomes Paul on the road to Damascus, which we'll think about in a few weeks' time, we begin to see the power of a life which is overtaken by missionary zeal and endeavour and passion, and his missionary journeys are the stuff of adventure and action, and the message just goes whoosh. And in verse 49, we see Jesus say, crucially, I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. Pointing forward, as we know, to the happenings of Acts 2 and Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes. Indeed, in Luke's second volume, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we read Jesus' final pre-ascension words to the disciples. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. From now on, the disciples are in no doubt as to the identity of of Jesus. From now on, their lives will be characterized by service and loyalty and dedication to carrying out Jesus' commands. For some of them, it will end in persecution and death. But they're convinced. What about us this morning? What about our journey? We may, we may not know the physical presence of Jesus in our walks and on our travels or sitting at our tables in our homes. But don't we have the Holy Spirit, one just like him, with us every day, within us every day, guiding our steps? We may not have the Lord sit down and explain from Moses and all the prophets all the things concerning himself from the scriptures, yet don't we have the very Holy Spirit, the one who breathed life into the writers of his word, interpreting scripture for us? We may not hear the audible voice of Jesus speaking, peace be with you amidst our troubles. But don't we have the promise that if we pray and bring all our anxieties to God, that he will grant us peace beyond all understanding. Let's journey on with Jesus. Let me close with the words of Romans chapter 8, verse 11, where Paul writes, The Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Amen. 
Let's pray and then let's sing uh, as we close our service. Let's pray. Lord of dawn and darkness, how grateful we are for your loving mercies. You saw our fears and doubts, our suspicion, our mistrust, and you have banished them from our lives. You've replaced them with hope and peace and love and joy. And you've called us to be your witnesses, Father, to all the world. Unafraid of what others might think or say about us, we have been invited out of our darkened hideaways into the light of your world as emissaries of hope and justice, of peace and compassion. Be with us, we pray as we participate in ministries of healing and hope through this church, in our community, region, nation, and across the world. Give us courage and strength to walk with you, to be your disciples on the road in all the circumstances of our lives. For we ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. We go back to that Easter weekend for our closing hymn today. It's an old favourite of many of you, I know. It's one that we've not sung very often, but I think you know it well enough and you'll, as my father would have said, give it laldy as we sing the old rugged cross. And after this, I would invite you to stay standing. One of the stewards will come and help to direct you safely as we exit the building. Let's stand, please.